Yes, Judge, she flew out of the case and she's back in the state. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Delario. Good morning. Could you please state your full name for the, for the record, please? Sure. Albert James Delario III. All right. And you are known, I take it, by uh, those that are close to you as AJ, right? Yes, that's correct. All right. Mr. Delario, did you attend college? Yes. And where did you, where did you go to school? LaSalle University. Okay. And did you graduate? I did. When did you graduate? 1997. All right. And what did you get your degree in? Communications and English. After you graduated, did you find work as a journalist? I did. Okay. And where, where did you go to work? Where did you first start in this journalism business? Uh, full time, I worked at the Sentinel newspaper in East Brunswick, New Jersey. All right. And what kind of paper was the Sentinel? I was a local newspaper. Okay. General, covered local events, all types of matters? Yeah, I covered a lot of zoning boards and stuff along those lines. Okay. City council meetings? City council meetings, yes. All right. Now, it, I take it you've worked for other publications as well? I have. All right. What other um, print publications have you worked for? Uh, after the Sentinel, I went to Montgomery County Newspapers, which was a group of local newspapers in the Philadelphia area. All right. And uh, did you also work for any magazines in the Philadelphia area? I worked at Philadelphia Magazine between uh, 2007 and 2008. Okay. And what kind of magazine is Philadelphia Magazine? Uh, it's a regional publication, which, you know, covers news, features, culture in the city. Okay. Now, I understand you've also worked, obviously, for online publications? I have. Okay. Who have you worked for in the online publishing industry? 
Uh, offhand, well, my, most of my career I spent at Gawker Media. Uh, originally, I was an editor at Hotjack.com, which was a gambling news publication. And I worked there between November 2000. No, sorry, about summer 2005 to November 2005. All right, and all together. Did you also work for a uh, publication connected with the American Lawyer? Yes, I worked for Law.com as a wire reporter. Okay. Um, did you work at any time for a, like a lifestyle, men's lifestyle publication? I did. Trillist.com I worked for. Okay. All right. Now, all told, how many years had you, from the time you worked at the Sentinel in the early days, up to the present, how many years have you worked as a journalist? Uh, getting close to 20 years, I would say, 18. Okay. Now, when did you first go to work for Gawker Media? It would be 2005. Okay. And what was your position at that point in time? I was editor-in-chief of Object.com. Okay. Now, Object, what was Object? Uh, Object was a gambling news Sites which uh, where we also convert to you know professional poker players. Okay, and so did you covered uh, gambling news. Were you an expert in gambling news? Uh, I was supposed to be, but I was more talking about gambling news and poker players. Okay, all right. How long did you work at Object? I worked there for about six months. And why for such a short time? Uh, they discontinued the site, got for me Okay. And then what did you do? From there, I freelanced a little bit before I went to Thrillist.com. Okay. And when you were freelancing, did you sell stories to a variety of publications? I did, yeah. All right. And who were some of the publishers that you sold stories to? Uh, I did some work for Salon.com. I did a story for uh, New York Times, actually, at that point. Okay. Any other uh, publications that you recall? Not offhand. All right. I take it a variety of, you would prepare pieces for a variety of news outlets? Yes. All right. Now, after freelancing, what did you do after you had a period where you were a freelance journalist? No, this is, is it after freelancing? Yeah, after you freelanced, where was the next full-time position that you That had? would be Thrillist.com. Okay. And what, what period in time did you go to uh, Philadelphia Magazine? I went to Philadelphia Magazine between 2007 and 2008. Okay. And how long were you there? Approximately one year. Okay. Now, after Philadelphia Magazine, did you return to Gawker Media? I did. Okay. And so that would have been about 2008? Yes, sir. And what was your position when you went back to Gawker Media? I was senior writer of Deadspin.com. Okay. And then, do, how long were you in that position? About three months. Okay. And then, what, what happened at that point? I was promoted as editor-in-chief of Deadspin. Okay. What is, what is Deadspin? Deadspin is a sports site that talks about uh, irreverent sports news and commentary. Okay. And how long did you hold the position as editor-in-chief of Deadspin? Three and a half years. Okay. And after that, after you left Deadspin, where did you go? From there, I was promoted to editor-in-chief of Copper.com. All right. And about when was that? So in November of 2011. Okay. But as the editor-in-chief of Gawker.com, what were your responsibilities? Uh, the main responsibilities were staffing, both hiring and firing, uh, develop the vision for the site, write, edit, 
manage. Okay. So you had a, a broad range of duties. I did. You mentioned right. How much time did you have? How much of the work you did was actually writing pieces for Gawker.com? So it was about 10% of the job. Okay. How long did you serve as Gawker.com's editor? I left the position in January of 2013, so about a little over a year. All right. And when you say you left the position, did you leave Gawker Media at that time? I did. Okay. Why did you leave at that point in time? Um, I was ready to move on to other things outside of Gawker Media. Now, when you left Gawker Media, about three, that would be about three months after the publication that is at issue in this case. And what I'm referring to is the post regarding the Hulk Hogan sex tape, right? Yes. Did your departure from Gawker Media have anything to do with the post of the story that brings us all together here today? None whatsoever. Okay. Now, where did you go when you left Gawker Media? So we're talking about the, what, roughly the spring of 2013? Yeah. Uh, from there, I was a consultant for Spin Media. And what is, if you could tell folks, what is Spin Media? Uh, Spin Media is also a content publishing company. They had around 30 or so web properties ranging from music sites to culture sites. Okay. All right. And you indicated you were a consultant? Yeah, I was an editorial consultant. What did you do in the capacity as a consultant? I looked over some of their properties and offered them suggestions on how to move forward editorially. And did your position change or did you work as a consultant your whole time there? No. In the fall of that year, I was given a full-time position with Spin Media as editorial director. Okay. Editorial director? Yes. All right. Now, what, what does that job encompass, or at least what, does it, what did it encompass when you worked at Spin Media? At the time, the role was designed to give me complete control over the editorial direction of some of the properties they wanted to focus on. Okay. And how long did you serve in that capacity? Only about a month, I would say. Okay. And... What happened at that point in time? Uh, the executive team that had brought me in had changed and I was laid off along with several other people too. Okay. So after you were laid off uh, from Spin Media, what, what did you do next? From there I decided to start my own media company and began the conceptualization and fundraising process for RG3, which is is radar.com. Okay. So you were seeking to do what? Your own online publication? Yes. Okay. And um, what, was it, what was it called? The online publication was called radar.com. So the name of the publication was, in fact, radar? Yes. Sir. Okay. And could you please tell us a little bit about the website? What was, your, what was the focus to be of radar.com? Uh, Radar was originally supposed to be a set of local tabloids. We were going to launch in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York. Okay. And tell me this. How big of an operation was this? Initially, we hired three full-time people. Uh, we had an editor in San Francisco, an editor in Los Angeles, and we had a managing editor. And then... That's on the editorial side, and then we also had a vice president of operations. Okay. Now, you indicated that you had to raise funds for this operation. Right? I did. Okay. And how much money did you raise in the initial round of fundraising? In the seed round, as it's referred to, I raised 
about $1.1 million, close to $1.1 million. Thank you. Um, now, let me ask you this. Who, who were some of your early investors in this operation? Well, uh, Gawker Media was an initial investor, as was uh, Radical Investments, which is operated by Mark Cuban. I didn't catch this. Sorry, Mark Cuban was one of the investors. What was the name of his investment? Radical Cuban. Investments. Okay. All right. Uh, any other investors? Yeah, we had approximately four more. All right. Now, all told, stepping back and, and looking at your career at this point, all told, how long did you work for uh, Nick Den or his publishing operations? Uh, a little over five years, I want to say. Okay. On and off. On and off. You'd work there for a time, you'd go somewhere else, you'd come back. So, not that's, you didn't work there steadily. I did not. Okay. And how would you describe your professional relationship with Mr. Denton? I was very good, very solid. We worked well together. Okay. Let me ask you this. How many publishers, as you sit there and think back over your career thus far, how many publishers, approximately, have you worked for in your career? Probably close to a dozen, I would say, over okay. take. And as you sit there, how does Nick Denton compare to those other publishers you've worked for? I use the best one I've ever worked for. Right. Delario, what we're going to do now is we're going to shift our focus. We're going to move from your background, your history in journalism, and we're going to focus on the publication that it, that's here it is. Okay? So if you could direct your attention to that post, are you okay. focused there? Okay. Um, now, when that was published, and you've seen it here, you've been in court each day. That's Plaintiff's Exhibit 2, and that is your post dated October 4, 2012. You're familiar with that, I take it? I am. Okay. Now, were you in your position as Editor-in-Chief at Gawker when that Hulk Hogan sex tape post was published on October 4, 2012? Yes, I was Editor-in-Chief. Okay. Now, what I want you to do, or to focus your attention before the piece actually came out. Prior to October 4 of 2012, did you know who Hulk Hogan was? I did. All right. And what did you know about Hulk Hogan? That uh, he was one of the best professional wrestlers of all time. All right. And did you know his given name? his name that he was given at birth. I did. Okay. And did you know him to be Terry Belay? I was familiar that that was his given name, yes. Okay. All right. Now, did you know that he had a reality TV show? I did. And what did you know it is? Uh, Hogan Knows Best. Okay. Did you ever watch that show? I have watched it, yes. All right. Now, let me ask you this. Have you, yourself, been a fan of WWE wrestling? I have. Did you watch WWE wrestling on television? I did. Okay. And during what period of time would you, yourself, have watched WWE wrestling? Uh, the early 80s, I was a fan up until about uh, 1992, I watched it pretty regularly. Okay. So from the early 80s to 1992, do you remember any specific matches, any big events that you yourself watched? Yeah, I watched the first WrestleMania in 1984-85, I believe. Okay. And was Mr. Was 
Hulk Hogan in the first WrestleMania? Yes, he was. Okay. And did you observe a bout or match, I guess it's called, uh, involving Hulk Hogan? Yeah, I believe he was a tag team partner with Mr. T. Okay. Um, Mr. T was the fellow with the uh, Mohawk. He that was, Mr. yes. T? He was B.A. Baracus on the 18th. Okay. All right. And who did Hulk Hogan and Mr. T, who did they wrestle in this tag team event? I believe they wrestled against uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper and uh, Mr. Wonderful Paul Wendorf. Mr. Who? Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful. Okay. And who, for your part, if you can tell us, who were you rooting for? I was rooting for Rowdy Roddy Piper and Paul Wendorf. Okay. And why is that? I was a huge Rowdy Roddy Piper fan. All right. Um, so what was your, your view of Hulk Hogan? Now we can move a little forward in time. What was, what was your, your view of Hulk Hogan prior to October 2012? Uh, he was someone that I'd grown up with and known very well because I was a fan of WWE growing up. And also knew him as an iconic figure. All right. When you were small, when you were a young man, young boy actually, were you, did you have any of that, well, I'll call it paraphernalia, any of the toys and the dolls and this type of thing? I, I did. I had uh, several of the wrestling dolls, and then I also had thumb wrestlers, which were these little rubber characters that you put on your thumbs. Okay. Thumb wrestlers, so you could have your own little mini matches? That was the idea, yeah. All right. And among the thumb wrestlers that you had, did you have a Hulk Hogan thumb wrestler? Yeah, I absolutely did, yes. Okay. At the time when you were a small boy, did you like Hulk Hogan? I did. Okay. And now, we're going to go from that period, and we're going to move forward in time, and at some point, now, now you're an adult, you're sitting in this editorial seat at Gawker.com. You're the editor-in-chief, all right? Yes. So we have moved up through the decades. At some point, did you learn about a Hulk Hogan um, sex tape, or a tape reportedly involving Mr. Hogan engaged in sex with a woman? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. And when, when was that? Approximately March of 2012. Okay. And who, who was it that broke this story about there possibly being Hulk Hogan sex tape out there? It was TMZ.com. Okay. Now, what do you recall about that TMZ report that comes out in March of 2012? I recall that the existence of a Hulk Hogan sex tape was being shopped around and that they were looking for the people that were involved in shopping the tape. Okay. And did you see this TMZ report online? Did you see it on television? How did it come to find its way to you? Uh, I saw it online. Okay. And as an editor of Gawker.com, would you in the normal course of your reporting and you know, overseeing, overseeing the doc? Gawker.com site, would you visit TMZ on some kind of regular basis? I would. Okay. And for what purpose? Um, well, as editor of Gawker, you do frequently check out other publications that sometimes cover it. But uh, I was also a part of TMZ's mailing list, so I would get regular updates in my email inbox about their latest stories. Okay, so they would send you notices like, hey, there's a story on X, hey, there's a story on Y, and then if it was of interest to you, you would, what, click on that? Yeah, I would click on it and go over and read it. Okay. Do you recall anything else about this TMZ report? I do. Um, there was a phone conversation, I believe, with the editor and publisher of TMZ, Harvey Levin, and also... Uh, Hulk Hogan and David Houston. Okay. Pardon me. Um, and David Houston is the same gentleman that we saw early, early, last week, Mr. Uh, Hogan's lawyer. Yes. And 
And was that that was made clear on the uh, TMZ report? It was. Okay. All right. Now, do you recall anything that Mr. Uh, Hogan said at the time about these events when this story came out in March of 2012? Yeah, I, I remember him saying he had no idea who the tape was with, and that was my main takeaway, but that clearly did exist. Okay. Um, the bit of a mystery, I take it. That's what it seems uh, at the time, yeah. Okay. Let us move forward in time once again. And did you hear, after March 2012, did you hear any other reports about a Hulk Hogan sex video? I did. And where did you hear this, and what did you hear? Uh, there's a website called thedirty.com, which had reported that it had seen the Hulk Hogan sex tape and was showing still photographs of what was on the tape. All right. And did you yourself see these still photographs that they displayed on the Internet? I did. Okay. And when was that in time? That was April of 2012, I believe. Okay. So you went online, read the report, saw the stills that were displayed there. I did. Right? Do you recall, basically, when you saw those stills, could you, what's your recollection of what they looked like? Uh, it was a grainy footage of a, an individual that looked like Hulk Hogan, as I had known Hulk Hogan to look like. And he was in a bed, uh, but it was a little unclear as to what was going on, but just given the information that I had in front of me, it was a sexual act of okay. some sort. All right. Now, let me ask you this. When was the next time that you remember hearing anything to do with a Hulk Hogan sex tape? It's September of 2012. Okay. And what happened in September of 2012? I received an email from a man named Tony Burton. All right. And when did you receive that email? Late September 2012. Okay. So this would be this would be approximately six months from the time of the first TMZ report in March. Yes. Okay. Now, if you could tell us who is Tony Burton. Uh, Tony Burton was a manager for the Don Buckwald Agency. All right. And what what is the Don Buckwald Agency? It's an agency that represents, and at that time I knew them as representing various radio personalities. Okay. And how, how was it that you knew Mr. Burton? I take it you've never worked in radio. I you? did not. Okay. So how was it that you knew Mr. Burton? Uh, well, he had emailed the site that I used to work for, Deadspin. He had emailed there, I believe, you know, one or two times. So I was familiar with his name. All right. So met him in connection with past work. Did he have clients that had some interest in the things you did at Deadspin? Uh, that was what I was led to believe. Yes. Okay. All right. So now he contacts you in September of 2012, right? Yes. So when he contacts you, what, is, what does he have to say for himself? He emailed me and said that he had a client of his that wanted to send me a package. All right. And did you know at that time who it was that he was representing? I did not. All right. Did he give you any idea what it was that he thought would be of interest to you? Not in that initial email, no. Okay. At some point... I take it you had a subsequent communication with Mr. Burton? I did. Okay. And as after that first email exchange? Yes. All right. Now, in those subsequent contacts, what did you and Mr. Burton discuss? Uh, he asked me to have a phone conversation, and we spoke on the phone. And he told me a little more about 
what he thought the package that was being sent to me would, would be. All right. And let me ask you, what, what did he say the package was going to contain? I said it might be a tape, and a tape having something to do with the Hulk Hogan sex tape story that was reported in March and April. Okay. So the same sex tape that had been out there being discussed prior to that? Yes. At least that's your understanding. That was my understanding. Okay. So what did he say that he wanted from Gawker? What, did he, what was he asking you for? I, he was just asking me to receive the package and take a look at it. And that was it. Did he ask for your, yes, for your mailing address? He asked if we had a, a P.O. box that it sent it to, and I just gave him our office address at Delta Media. Okay. And did you want to know who he was representing? It was not important to me. Okay. Did you ask him who he was representing? He had just said a client of his that was a, a fan of myself and Deadspin. Okay. So he didn't offer more particulars, I take it? He did not. Okay. Now, in this discussion with Mr. Burton, did he raise the subject of money? Not at all. Did he tell you that he wanted money for the tape? No. Did he tell you that this undisclosed, unnamed client of his wanted money for the tape? Uh, no. Okay. Did he, at any point, did anybody else in this whole, since the time you got the call from him to the present, did anybody ever contact you and say that they wanted money for that tape that ultimately found its way to you? No. Okay. Now, did Mr. Burton explain the motivation for this offer? He tell you why someone wanted to give you the tape? Uh, other than just being a fan of Dead Spin, no. Okay. No, no more detail than that? None. Okay. Now, did you provide Mr. Burton with your address at Gawker? I did. Okay. And did you receive this video that had been foretold? Uh, it was sent to our office, yes. Okay. And now, when the video comes to Gawker's office, were you there at the time? I was not. I was on vacation. Okay. So you were where? I was in Montana seeing Pearl Jam, and I had also visited Portland, Oregon, and Seattle. Okay. Um, so you're away on vacation. Did you learn while you were away that the video had, in fact, arrived? Yes. Okay. And how was it that you learned that it showed up? I was told by another employee at Gawker Media that the tape had arrived and was sitting on my desk. Okay. And who was that other employee? Emma Carmichael. And what was her position with Gawker.com at that time? She was managing editor. Okay. Now, had you given her a heads up to look out for this package? I did. Okay. Um, now, so it comes. Does she, she reaches out to you and says, okay, it has actually arrived, right? Yes. Okay. And what did you do when you learned that the sex tape had arrived? I told her to open it up and take a look at what it was. Okay. Confirm that it was what had been said to you? That's correct. Okay. So do you, to your knowledge, did Ms. Carmichael view portions of this sex tape? That's correct. Okay. Now, did she say anything to you about the video? Uh, she said that she had watched it in some capacity. I believe she said, thank you, but in a sarcastic way. Right. And did she say it is, in fact, the whole COVID sex tape? She did confirm that fact. Yes. Okay. Mr. Delario, did the package that came, did it have a return address? No. Okay. Now, 
at some point, I take it, you come back from vacation, you come back from the West Coast, and about when was that? It was early October of 2012. Okay. And upon your return, did you yourself review the video? I did. Okay. And what was the duration of the video? It was a little over 30 minutes. All right. And what was the quality of this video? Uh, it was poor quality. It was very dimly lit, black and white and grainy. Okay. okay. Could you recognize anyone that appeared in the video? Yeah, I recognized Hulk Hogan. Okay. And could you recognize anyone else? Uh, there was a woman in the video as well, which, according to other previously reported news, was rumored to be Heather Clem. And then there was also a male voice at the beginning of the recording, which, according to other reports, seemed to be Bubba the Love Sponge. Okay. When you say a voice, so the voice on the tape appeared, what, I take it you couldn't see the person who was speaking? No, yeah, in the early, I would say, I want to say, say the first couple minutes of the tape, uh, there's a, a shot of Hulk Hogan and Heather Clem on the bed, and then there's a voice that appears to be coming from whatever doorway was there, and he says something along the lines of, uh, you guys go have fun now, something like that. Okay. Um, was there was there sexual activity that was going on at this time? I believe a little earlier, before he had walked in the room, uh, Hulk Hogan was uh, performing oral sex on Heather Club. All right. Now, so you watched the video. Did you have any questions in your mind at that point in time that the gentleman who appeared on camera was, in fact, Hulk Hogan? No, there was no doubt in my mind. Okay. None at all? No. Okay. Let me ask you this. Have you... You've watched the tape that has been identified in these proceedings as Defendant's Exhibit 311, haven't you? I have. Okay. And Defendant's Exhibit 311 is the same video that you received back in October 2012. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So that would be Defendant's Exhibit 311 would be the video that you watched in October of 2012? That's correct. All right. And I take it that is the same video that you ended up writing about in your commentary that was published on October 4, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, let's take you back to October 4, or, pardon me, October of 2012. What was your reaction to this tape once you viewed it? I was amused by it. All right. Did it, when you say amused, um, What was your reaction based on where things were, what you knew, how this all came to be? You indicated you were amused. Why were you amused? Well, I grew up watching Hulk Hogan and knew him as this character for most of his life. And this was not a situation I expected to ever watch him in. All right. Now, did the tape, the one that was sent to you, did it comport with these previous reports you'd had about the sex tape and, and all of that, starting with what you heard in uh, March from TMZ? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, given the past news about it, I, it seemed to be, you know, it was my reasonable assumption that this was the tape that everyone was talking about, or at least... TMZ and the Dirty at that time. All right. Now, you indicated you saw this, 
first reaction was uh, amused. But did it prompt you to ask questions that went beyond just your personal reaction? It was strange, other, you know, especially if it was Love with a Love Sponge talking in the beginning of this tape, and it was actually his wife, which, as far as I could tell, that seemed to add up in terms of the rumors that were out there. Um, yeah, I would find that strange because it seemed like Bubba the Love Sponge was okay with having Hulk Hogan, who also knew to be his best friend, you know, having sex with his wife. Okay. So, now, shifting from kind of what you thought was at that particular point in time, back to the process that ultimately ends up resulting in a publication. With respect to the process, what did you do next? Uh, from there, after viewing it, I was thinking about what I was going to write about. I decided I was going to write about what I'd seen on the tape. I was also going to do a commentary on celebrity sex tapes in general. But first I had to mark off the portions of the tape that I wanted to pass along to our video editor to spice up for publication. Okay. Now, who, who was Gawker? Who was Gawker.com's video editor at that point in time? That uh, was Kate Bennett. All right. And what did you direct her to do? I directed her to look at the timestamps that I had marked off for her and to find those parts of the tape and to splice it all together in a very short version of 30-minute tape. Okay, so you're going to take the 30-minute tape and you were going to distill that down to a much smaller, shorter portion, right? Yeah, based on the stuff that I was planning on writing about, okay. I wanted those excerpts there. Right. And how, when you gave Ms. Bennett this direction, how was it you decided which portions you wanted excerpted and which portions you were thinking about writing about? Well, given what I was going to say about celebrity sex tapes in general, I wanted the more uh, innocuous and banal conversations between Mr. Hogan and Ms. Clem in the video. That was what I was focusing on. That was the part that I found most amusing. Okay. And did you want to also so did you want to also show some portions of sexual activity? Yeah, it's very brief portions just to clarify and confirm that they were in fact having sex. Okay. As had been out there previously, I think. That's correct. Okay. Now, let's look um, at an exhibit or return to an exhibit that was put on during the plaintiff's case last week and I'll ask you to take a look at that. Um, Brother, Ken, if you could please call up. Um, plaintiff's Exhibit 230. If you could display that on the screen. Okay. We can blow that up. All right. Now, Mr. Delario, if you could look at the portion there, the text of that uh, email. Well, let's look first at the date. You see it is an email between you and Tony Burke. You see that? I did. Okay. And the date appears there October 3rd, 2012, at 11 a.m. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Now, if we could look down to that first substantive paragraph that starts so, and look there at the first sentence. Okay. So, we're going to slice this up into a highlight reel, then do some commentary on the stills. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. All right. And this was, it, we looked at last week, this was part of a string of emails between you and Mr. Burke, right? That's correct. Okay. So the point that we have there, and there has been talk in these proceedings about a highlight reel. Do you recall that? I did. Okay. You say, we're going to slice this up 
into a highlight reel and then do some commentary on the stills, right? Yes. What did you mean when you wrote this to Mr. Burton? What did you mean by a highlight reel? Uh, that I was going to take the 30 minute tape and then whittle it down to a very short amount of time. Mostly based off the stuff that I was going to write about. Okay. So that's what you were describing to us a moment ago. You were going to talk about some of the more, how should we say it, mundane aspects of what was on the table. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Now, when you use the phrase highlight reel, were you referring to the portions of the video that showed sexual activity? Uh, not necessarily, no. No. And how much of the video that was ultimately, how much of the sex tape excerpts that were ultimately posted on Gawker.com, how much were sexual activity? I think it was, it was well under 10 seconds. Okay. Would it be fair to you say well under? Would it be fair to say roughly nine seconds? Nine seconds. Okay. Now, so when it has been talked about in terms of highlight reel, I take it this was not a highlight reel, it didn't constitute a highlight reel of the most graphic sexual content that was on this whole code of sex kit. No, not at all. And I take it that was not your intent. Is that fair to say? That's very fair to say. Yes. Okay. If it had been your intent to do a highlight reel of the most graphic sexual material, would the post that went up containing these video excerpts on October 4, 2012, be different than what Walker put up on that day? Yes, very much so. Substantially so? Substantially. Okay. Um, now, at this point in time, when Ms. Bennett gives you her first effort at the excerpts, the distilled down excerpts for you to write about, how long, about how long was that bit that she gave you? Uh, it was about three minutes. Okay. And did that version, that three minutes, did that ever get published? No, it did not. Okay. And... I take it, then, that you end up editing it down even further. Is That's that correct. correct. Yeah. Okay. And what was the duration of the ultimate sex tape excerpts that you posted on October 4? A minute and 41 seconds. Okay. So she, the process then is Ms. Benner ed edits the 30-minute video down to about three minutes, right? That's correct. Okay. And then she distills it down further to a minute and 41 seconds. That's correct. Okay. And are you the person that is supervising this process all the way along the road? I am. Okay. So, you've already explained to us about the nine seconds of sexual activity. Then, the remainder of the excerpts that you posted, what did that show? Most of the conversation that I was talking about, plus I believe there are some scenes of him putting his clothes back on and then also having conversations with Mrs. Clem. There's also a shot of him answering his phone and then looking at his phone and not picking up his phone. Okay. So are these some of the things that you then wrote about in your commentary? That was some of it, yes. Okay. And did you do? Any, did you ask Ms. Bennett to do anything else as part of her job? Uh, I asked her to put subtitles. Okay. And why did you ask her to put subtitles on the excerpt? I really wanted to focus on the things that were being said on the sex tape. Okay. The conversation between Mr. Hogan and Mrs. Klein. You indicated earlier that the quality of the video was... Uh, is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Okay. 
was the quality of the audio also somewhat poor? It was difficult to hear, so the subtitles helped along with that process. Okay. At this point in time, you now have a one minute, 41 second excerpt from the original sex tape. Did you consider, did you consider blurring any portion of the video? No, I did not. Did you consider pixelating any portion of the video? I did not. Did you consider obscuring, like, private parts? You've seen videos where they put a little circle, or that kind of thing? That kind of thing, no. Okay. You're familiar with that? Yeah, I am. Okay. Why, why didn't you consider that here? Uh, first, the footage was, was pretty poor to begin with, and you know, there was really not that much time that was spent focusing on the actual sexual activity in the tape itself. That was it. All right. Now, at what point in this process did you write your commentary? I, I was, after I viewed the tape initially, I began to formulate what I was going to write about. So, yeah, I would say I was at least writing it at that point in terms of a draft, or at least drafting an idea. All right. Now, so you've got the excerpt. You write your commentary. Did you show it to anyone at Gawker? After I was done writing it, I passed it along to Emma Carmichael. Okay. And you indicated earlier Emma's role is the managing editor for yes. Gawker.com? Okay. Anyone else that, at Gawker that you spoke to about posting this video before it was published? Anyone else I spoke to? I, uh, I think I also passed along to Leah Beckman as well. Okay. And what was her role? She was associate editor at Gawker.com. All right. Did you reach out to anybody beyond the editorial side of the operation? I reached out to the business side. Okay. And why would you have reached out to the business side? Uh, well, as a courtesy for when we do some material that deals with sex, I used to give the ad side a heads up to collapse all the ads on the page because advertisers don't usually like to be next to some material that's somewhat sexually explicit. Okay. So it's not where they would prefer to have their ads appear? That was my understanding. Okay. Now you used a term collapsed. I told them to collapse the ads on the page. What does that mean? That means there would be no advertising on the page at the time the post was up. Okay. So it's not going to appear next to the story about a whole coat of sex tape. That's my understanding. Okay. And is that, um, is that standard operating procedure at Gawker? I believe it was at the time. Okay. Um, let us do this. Another exhibit that we looked at last week was um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2, which is a copy of the challenged post. Mr. Delario, can you make that out there? I can. Okay. Um, now, you see there, above the headline, you see there it says NSFW. Yes. Okay. So is that, what, what would you call that? What is, what is that at Gawker? Uh, that's a tag that's given out as courtesy to our readers to signify that it's not safe for work. Okay. And is that, um, is that like an advisory? Yes. Okay. Is that common in the online publishing world? It's fairly common. Okay. So you give people a heads up? Yes. All right. Now, so they know that what this story is going to contain is adult content, should we say? That's safe to say, yeah. Okay. Perhaps nudity. Perhaps nudity. Okay, some sexual content, things of that nature. Yes. Okay. Now, is, 
is that NSFW advisory or warning that you see there, I take it that is related to the heads up that you gave your colleagues in advertising. That's correct. Okay. So that's how the site deals with this then, right? Yes. Okay. Now, did you, when you're putting this together, did you include any um, links in your article? I did. Okay. And Tim, if you could scroll down to the second paragraph. Now, if you see there, um, well, let me ask you this before we go to the individual links. What kind of links did you include? In this first part? Yeah. Uh, they were links to other famous celebrity sex tapes. Okay. And what was your purpose in, in including links to other famous celebrity sex tapes? Uh, that was done to establish the fact that this had become a, a genre of sorts, that there were many celebrity sex tapes, that it was its, its own cottage industry in its own way. Okay. It, had it become, by this point in time, in the fall of 2012, had it become somewhat of a cultural phenomenon, at least that's, for some folks? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So you are providing, through the what we can do on the Internet, you can have a link, right? And it will take you to some reference to these other past celebrity sex tapes. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at the first one there, it says, if you can, uh, second sentence, well, let's just start, let's pick up with big enough to smash a bird horn with authority. Do you see that? I do. Okay. And... If we were to clink, if we had internet access in here, we could clink. We could click on that, and where would that take us? Uh, that would take, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was a, a photo of the Tommy Lee and Pamela Anderson sex tape. Okay. So that would remind us of that whole sex tape episode. Yes. Okay. So if your reader went along in that same sentence and said, or their faces are lit up like Gulf War Scud missile footage after midnight. You yes. see that link. Also in red, right? So if I, as your reader, clicked on that, where does that take me? Uh, that took the reader to a page uh, referencing the Paris Hilton sex tape. Okay. And if I continued on, it says, their sex, purposeful, vaunted celebrity sex, is still incredibly dull. The normalcy of it is exciting, though. When you see glimmers of, and we come to our next one, sloppy kissing in red. Do you see that? I do. What does the reference to sloppy kissing refer to? Where would that take us? Uh, that took the reader to a link of the Kim Kardashian and Ray J. So it's like that. Okay. And lastly, it says Orson shoulder moles are just an earnest, breathy, post-coital, I love... You see that one, that red one? I do. What is the I love one? Where would that take us? I, I think, that again, that was a reference to the Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee sex tape. Okay. All right. Neil, did you include these links that we've just looked at? Did, did you include those for what purpose? Context or? Context then to show how... Many times, celebrity sex tapes have been talked about and viewed in the mainstream media. Okay. Now, if we go further down, in that next paragraph that starts on top, okay, you said, let's go a little bit further down, about the thir end of the third line. You see it says, this footage was stealthily circulated last April. Did you see that? Uh, yes. Okay. Now we come to another one of those red text portions. And you see it says, TMZ reported its existence. I do. Okay. If I were to click on that, where would that take me? That would take it back to the original TMZ written report about the Hulk Hogan sex tape being shopped. Okay. 
And is this the one that included uh, an appearance, at least on the phone, by Mr. Hogan? I can't remember exactly, but I don't think so. I think this was the written report that was oh. from TMZ. Okay. So that's the written report from TMZ. Yes. How about the next? Then if the next one says the dirty showed some screenshots, do you see that one? I do. Okay. And where does that take us? That takes back to the dirty website where it reported that it had an exclusive Hulk Hogan's sex tape. Okay. And its screenshots that accompanied it. Okay. And then if we continue on. You report the Hulk lawyered up because he claims he was, and we have it in red, he was, quote, secretly filmed. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Now, if we click on that, where does that take us? I think that takes it back to the TMZ phone interview that was between Harvey Levin, Hulk Hogan, and David Houston. Okay. So that's the one supporting that. That's when he said, he being Mr. Houston, said it was secretly filmed, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, the last one there, a little below where we're just looking. Last week, you see the link to Heather Clem? Yes. And where, does, where would that take a reader? Uh, I believe it was another page that was discussing you know, whether or not the woman in the video was of the love sponge's wife, Heather Clem. Okay. All right. If we could now go back up to the top. There you go. Okay. You see there, a headline appears. Even for a minute, watching Hulk Hogan have sex in a canopy bed it's not safe for work, but watch it anyway. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Were you the person at Gawker.com who wrote that headline? I was. Okay. What did you seek to communicate to your readers when you wrote that posting that it was not safe for work, but watch it anyway? Uh, it was to talk about making a reference to the commentary that I was making that a lot of these celebrity sex tapes are things that most people say they don't want to actually see, but most watch them anyway. And I was kind of making a reference to myself that I was guilty of the same thing at this point. Okay. Were you being somewhat facetious? Yes, definitely. Okay. So the headline was an encapsulation or a shorthand effort to kind of summarize the point you were making in your commentary? That's true. Okay. And you indicated that it's kind of a it's kind of a observation about human nature, right? Yes. Okay. Is it like when you tell somebody don't peek or don't look? Right? So is it that kind of thing? Yes. All right. Now, did you think that your readers, despite the fact that it bears the NSFW advisory, did you think your readers would, in fact, go ahead, read your piece, and at least some of them click on the link and go see the video excerpt? Yeah, I thought that would be a possibility. Sure. Okay. All right. Did you, did you speak to anyone at Gawker prior to publishing on October 4, 2012? And what I mean by that is, yeah, that, that's not a good question. Um, let's, let's try this one. Okay, you already told us about the folks you talked to in preparing this piece. You got, had a conversation with Emma. She said, I've seen it, I've reviewed it. You had her review the piece when it was all done. Leah Beckman also reviewed the piece. You worked with Kate. You've told us about all of those conversations. And you gave a heads up to the advertising folks, right? That's correct. Okay. So now we're ready. The piece is done. You've done all that. As you sit here today with us, do you recall speaking with anyone else at Gawker before you saw that this was published on the site? 
No. Sorry, no. Did you speak with Nick Dent before it was published on the site? No, I didn't. Now, he is your boss, or was your boss at the time, right? That's correct. Okay. Did your position as editor-in-chief of Gawker.com, did that give you the editorial authority to post a story that was NSFW without consulting the publisher? Yeah, I believe it did. Okay. And how does that work in publishing? Is the editor in chief has that power? Yeah, most of the time, you know, the editor in chief decides what goes up on the site and what does not. Okay. Does the publisher review everything that is published on a site like Gawker.com? No. Now, what were you, if you could explain to us, when you post this on the site, October 4, 2012, what was it that you were looking to share with your readers? Uh, can you be more specific? Yeah. You've got the piece ready. Your, your point that you're trying to communicate to them. What did you hope folks would take away from seeing this? Uh, that the Hulk Hogan celebrity sex tape does in fact exist and that I had watched it and I have an opinion about how celebrity sex tapes fit into our culture. Here's some of the stuff that I found amusing in the Hulk Hogan celebrity sex tape. Okay. What, Mr. Delario, what was the reader reaction to this publication? It was a, an extremely popular story. I was pleasantly surprised by that. Okay. Did it did it remain popular for a long period of time? I, I believe it had a spike over the first couple of days, meaning that the traffic on it went up a little bit, and, and it was very popular in the first 24 hours that we had had it on the site. Then it went back down to, I guess, well, just a regular site that had already been published. Okay. Did you notice any, so I take it that's not uncommon. You have a piece that is popular, you have a spike, and then it drops down. Yes. Okay. But with this particular piece, did you notice any, what I'll call littler spikes or bumps or anything like that over time as we moved you know, forward? Yeah, I believe uh, about a week or two later there was a, another spike and... It came about the time when Hulk Hogan was doing a little bit of a media tour for the TNA wrestling and was talking a lot about this tape and this post in particular. Okay. Is, you were here with us last week. We heard testimony, saw some evidence about that New York media tour, Howard Stern, uh, the Today Show, all of that. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm referring to. Okay. So the bump corresponds with that publicity? Yeah, yeah. The, the Howard Stern show in particular was brought a lot of new readers to this post. Okay. And did you observe another bump further down the road later in time? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Did you observe any kind of a bump when the lawsuit was filed? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, let me ask you this. Were you surprised at the attention that this story received? I was very surprised. Yeah. When you, before you published it, who did you think, among your readers out there, who did you think was going to be interested in a story like this? Um, well, um, people who grew up with Hulk Hogan, like me, and knew of him as the character that he is. Okay. So were you thinking it would appeal to folks that follow professional wrestling? That would I, that's what I assume. Yeah. Okay. Let us do this. Let us shift our focus 
Your Honor, would you like to take, I'm happy to continue, I'm happy to take a break. Whatever is convenient for the court and the jury.